I want to add my own welcome to everyone and, and thank you all for joining us today uh, for our fourth event in the virtual seminar series. Um, you know, we know there, there's so many great virtual seminar programs uh, that have really grown out of this crazy period in, in time in our lives. And, um, you know, they're being put on by academic missions, uh, by industry partners, uh, and even colleagues uh, in the space. Uh, you know, one I'd mentioned is the Daily Blood and Bone Seminar series created by Kelly Mockless in Boston. So, um, you know, given the, the competition in, in the space, we really appreciate you spending some time with us um, today. So we've, we've created this series as an abbreviated 30 minute format seminar to, to really highlight technical overviews uh, and share some novel data from recent projects uh, utilizing the tapestry platform in translational oncology research. Um, we'll have some time at the end for, for Q&A, and, and then I've also included my email here uh, and my personal Twitter handle, along with, of course, Mission Bio's Twitter handle, and, and we certainly welcome any follow-up after this as well. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we will be making these slides available for your reference. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump in here. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, this is a brief 30 minute uh, agenda. So I've, I've got a lot to cover and um, to give you a quick run through of, of what I intend to cover here on the content, I'll give you an overview of uh, Mission Bio's approach to single cell biology and, and the tapestry platform. Um, you know, why single cell DNA sequencing is uh, an up and coming application and how it's being deployed today. I'll give you uh, some insight into the inner workings of the platform itself. So you have an idea of, of how it's being used and, and what's actually happening. Uh, from the molecular biology standpoint. And then I'll share four uh, vignettes of data um, covering actual applications. Uh, some of these are publications, uh, some of these are actually in preprint. Um, uh, so we'll be looking at ther therapeutic resistance to gilderitinib in AML, um, moving into measurable residual disease in, in AML, uh, so MRD, and then looking at uh, you know, how you can trace clonal evolution in metastatic melanoma. Uh, and that will also have a, a brief showcase of CNV data in renal cell carcinoma. And then I'll close with um, some of the multimodal, uh, more recent uh, developments on the platform, looking at the combination of the ability to genotype and immunophenotype the same cell. Uh, and this is data, uh, also an AML that, that I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek on that's in preprint right now. And then we'll close with a brief question and answer period. Um, so <clears throat> the first question we usually get, and, and one of the slides I like to start with is our mission statement, and I won't read it to you, but the reason that I start with this is because the first question is, how are you different from everyone else? The single cell space is increasingly becoming more and more crowded with many players, um, and, and so people want to know, how, how are we unique? How do we stand out from the crowd? And I wanted to define uh, and answer that question um, by saying, you know, really our focus is on resolving clonal architecture. Um, of actionable or prognostic variants, uh, you know, to help understand the clonal evolution using this uh, platform to profile longitudinal samples and hopefully provide impactful insights with translational potential, or more simply put, as uh, you know, the banner states, we're really interested in uh, enabling precision medicine and the realization of precision medicine. And so to that point, um, you know, what I'll be sharing with you today is really focused on targeted DNA sequencing panels and then layering in additional multi-omic capabilities with the platform. So with that, why single cell DNA sequencing? You know, there's a lot of great tools out there, um, you know, bulk, bulk DNA sequencing uh, for one. And so this is a common question. What can't I detect with bulk sequencing that I could detect with single cell DNA sequencing? I could do whole genome or whole exome sequencing. There's ultra deep sequencing looking for rare variants. Um, you know, in, in recent years, we've had uh, error correction really come out as a standard method uh, to, to help with looking for rare variants uh, and ensuring accuracy of calls uh, beneath 1%, we have duplex sequencing and so on. <clears throat> All of these are fantastic and they're great tools that actually complement uh, or rather enable single cell to build on top of uh, or stand on the shoulders of uh, a baseline technology. And so these are great for identifying any variants present in a sample where bulk sequencing uh, is really aided by single cell DNA sequencing is actually resolving the presence of those variants into a clonal architecture and understanding the, the frequency of distinct clones uh, in a genetic, genetically heterogeneous uh, disease. And that's really at the crux of why people are doing single cell DNA sequencing. Um, and so with bulk sequencing, you know, you get a variant allele frequency, which is essentially a population average of the number of cells in a given sample that's been ground up uh, with nucleic acid extracted and sequenced. Uh, and, and you get an idea of how many cells roughly may contain that variant. However, what you don't get is an accurate estimation of the clonal architecture or how the co-occurrence of those mutations or distinct DNA variants uh, can co-occur within the same cell, and then what the frequency of that clone is within the sample. 
And that's how single cell can really come in uh, with some significant value here. So in this cartoon, we're illustrating that there are two variants, a red variant and a blue variant for simplicity here, uh, roughly at a 40% uh, variant allele frequency or VAF. And with single cell approaches, uh, we can show that there's actually three distinct clones uh, looking at how those variants stack into um, you know, the clonal architecture. So we have two single mutant populations, one that is blue at a 20% clonal frequency. We have a single mutant red population. And then importantly, we have a double mutant clone, clonal population. So there's three distinct clones. And that double mutant population is really not um, able to be called by the bulk sequencing accurately. There's a number of methods to infer architecture, and we've done some comparisons and shown where there's uh, a significant room for improvement and opportunity to, to leverage this type of approach. And that's really, uh, you know, being applied to the problem statement of cancer. Um, you know, cancer, uh, is, from a somatic perspective, is you know, largely a genetically heterogeneous disease, and, and we know that it evolves in response uh, to, to therapy or over the course of disease. Uh, really illustrated here in this, this, this image here, where you have uh, what's typically thought to be an index clone or a founder clone that acquires subsequent mutations, and then you have opportunities for branched evolution where you see um, many different clones uh, growing out from what was originally uh, a single mutant clone. And so we're deploying that uh, in the translational space, looking often at how patients present and what the, the genetic heterogeneity or rather the clonal heterogeneity is at baseline before a patient has begun therapy. And then we understand how the clones respond or continue to expand in response to the selective pressure of therapy. And, and then ultimately we have uh, very valuable learnings of what clones are actually surviving therapy, becoming refractory and continuing to expand and drive relapse uh, or, or serve as refractory disease that never actually responded to therapy in the first place. So how is that being done? Um, you know, we, we built the tapestry platform to address that problem, specifically looking at single cell DNA sequencing. The platform itself, just to give you an overview and some insight into what we're talking about here, uh, consists of the tapestry instrument itself on the far left. <clears throat> we manufacture uh, catalog uh, panels as well as custom panels. And those are the consumable reagents that consist of a cartridge and all the reagents that go along with uh, deploying this assay. And then we have um, a suite of software tools that, that enable the analysis. And that includes everything from building custom panel software, or sorry, custom panel designs, uh, clear through analyzing the actual data itself and creating publication ready figures. So just to run through um, a, a list of, of specifications, some guardrails of understanding of, of what it is that this platform is capable of doing. Uh, so currently we stand as the only uh, single cell platform capable of doing uh, simultaneous profiling of single nucleotide variants, copy number variants, and immunophenotypes, so cell surface protein readouts uh, from the same cell at scale. And by scale, I mean uh, from a single sample, we're looking at upwards of five to 10,000 cells. And with a targeted approach, as I mentioned, we're typically looking in the hundreds of, of targeted loci. Uh, so we, you know, we currently, uh, most of our, our catalog panels range in the three to 400 amplicon range. We have the ability to go upwards of a thousand amplicons if necessary, uh, but you, know, I, you, you do need to keep in mind the, the consideration of sequencing costs as panels, panels do scale and size. From the CNV perspective, uh, given this is a, a targeted approach, um, resolution can be variable, which is a, a great thing. Uh, so we can look at gene level or chromosome level CNV uh, detection variants. We have the sensitivity to go down to 0.1%, and then depending on the genetic complexity of a given clone or specific uh, clone of interest, uh, we could actually go beneath that 0.1%, and I'll, I'll showcase some examples of that shortly. Um, and then we do support uh, a variety of, of sample types, including uh, solid tumor sample types, and viability is not a specific requirement as it is for many other types of single cell assays. Uh, due to the stability of DNA, we can actually isolate nuclei and flow nuclei through the platform in the same way that we would flow a single cell suspension. <clears throat> so how does it work? Uh, in bulk sequencing, as you're aware, you know, we're, we're grinding up a sample, we're extracting nucleic acids, preparing a library and then uh, aligning millions of reads across all of the, the um, nucleic acid in, in that sample. And then we get a variant allele frequency, as I described earlier. And from that, we can identify all of the variants that are present either within the exome or the whole genome. Or if you've taken a targeted bulk approach, um, you know, you'll identify the, the variants uh, concordant with each specific approach. Uh, and then you can try to infer clonal architecture. With single cell sequencing or the tapestry approach, we're isolating individual cells into uh, the, these droplets. 
within which we can manipulate the cell. So we're actually going to use a cell identifying barcode that's appended to each amplicon that's generated. So this is an amplification targeted based approach to genotyping. And that cell identifying barcode enables us to generate a library that identifies each cell. And once that, that barcode has been appended, we can actually re resume a bulk sequencing approach uh, and bioinformatically deconvolve data to ascribe multiple variants to individual cells as depicted here on the right. And so this is really done by uh, the tapestry platform using a novel two-step droplet microfluidic uh, platform approach. And, and really this is um, central to how we're different from other droplet-based platforms out on the available in the, the industry today. Um, and, and this is critical to enabling a protease that is going to prepare the nucleus for uh, efficient genotyping amplification. So I'll run you through this. We prepare a single cell suspension or nuclear uh, suspension from a, a, the nuclei isolation protocol that's flowed through the first, the first portion of the cartridge, which then intersects with uh, a, a reagent that contains a proprietary protease and lysis reagent. And it intersects this oil channel that pinches and creates, all, uh, creates this population of droplets. This happens very quickly. We're creating about a million droplets in five minutes. And the cell is actually lysed on contact in this positive flow channel and immediately encapsulated. So this lysate is, is uh, captured into a droplet, one cell per droplet, merged together with that protease. And we, we elute the population of droplets into a strip tube and place that onto a standard thermal cycler in the lab. We then activate that protease. That's going to do a digestion of chromatin and other DNA binding proteins that would inhibit uh, efficient genotyping PCR. Uh, so that, that prepares the DNA. We then irreversibly heat and activate that protease. <clears throat> so now we have a prepared uh, population of droplets containing this, this uh, cell lysate that has been digested with the protease. We then load that onto the second portion of the cartridge off of the thermal cycler. And the droplets continue on and merge with a stream of hydrogel beads uh, and, and other reagents that will be merged into the droplet. And so this, this hydrogel bead is actually delivering the cell identifying barcode. At the same time, we're also delivering in uh, some of the primer reagents that are panel specific, as well as the PCR reagents that will be used. So it's important that these two steps are separate because obviously the protease would degrade these downstream reagents that are necessary for the amplification uh, that's critical to the genotyping and then subsequent library preparation. So from here, uh, we now have within the droplet a hydrogel bead that contains the cell identifying barcodes that have uh, been attached to that bead. We have the PCR agents, the cell lysate, and our primers that are panel specific. Now we do a brief UV treatment that actually cleaves a photolinker sequence that removes that uh, cell identifying barcode off of the bead and frees it up for uh, hybridization capture with the actual primers that uh, will then be used in a, a, a amplification of you know, specific loci that you'd like to amplify up and genotype. Um, <clears throat> there's 10 cycles of PCR and after the completion of that, uh, the, the simultaneous incorporation of, of the barcode while amplifying that specific loci of interest will lead to uh, the formation of, of an amplicon library that's, that's now been barcoded and we can move forward in uh, standard Illumina sequencing library preparation, which is actually optimized and included as part of our kit. And so at the completion of, of the amplification since our barcode, we can break the emulsion uh, and move straight into standard Illumina library prep uh, and, and then uh, send off for sequencing. Now, importantly, as I mentioned, we're also capable of layering in additional multimodal capabilities into this workflow. And the one that I'll be talking about today uh, on top of the single nucleotide variant and CNV, the copy number variant analysis, is the ability to immunophenotype or, or uh, detect cell surface protein expression. <clears throat> and so by modifying this workflow, uh, there's actually just one step added up front where we're doing uh, a stain incubation with uh, antibodies that can be multiplexed. Um, right now, we're supporting upwards of 15 antibodies that can be used. Uh, we do have plans to expand that, and I'll touch on that uh, a little later in the presentation. Uh, but these are antibodies that have been conjugated with an oligo tag, and this oligo tag is unique to that antibody, and it importantly has a capture sequence on the end of it that will be used to capture into the library preparation step. So there will be primers that actually pull that in and incorporate that into the library preparation. So the amount of antibody uh, that, that is um, attached to the cell prior to being loaded in here will correlate with the number of sequencing reads um, up front. So this is carefully controlled for nonspecific binding. We've got cell washes and so on uh, in an optimized protocol that enable us to, to detect these proteins by sequencing readout. And I'll showcase some of that data. 
So um, with that, now that I've run through how the system and the platform works, I'll go ahead and jump into some of the data. Um, the first set will focus on uh, hematological malignancies. Uh, and, you know, I'll be sharing some of the data that, that our, our customers have, have looked at uh, in resistance to targeted therapy and then the MRD. So one of the first publications that we had uh, using primary samples and looking at acquired resistance in particular uh, was a collaboration between UPenn and UCSF. Um, this was led by Dr. Pearl and Dr. Smith, uh, together with Martin Carroll, and the first author was Christine McMahon. And, and they uh, published this last year uh, in, in 2019 in May. And, and so um, the, the idea here was to understand mechanisms of resistance to gilderitinib. And gilderitinib is, is a, a selective and potent FLT3 inhibitor. So it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that was approved by the FDA in uh, November of 2018 for use in relapsed refractory AML patients that contain that had a FLT3 mutation in their disease. And so the specific interest of this project was to deploy the tapestry platform uh, for a retrospective analysis of, of banked primary samples from their phase two trial uh, to, to look at developed resistance to gilderitinib and understand how the clonal uh, architecture evolved uh, to, to continue to expand and drive uh, relapse in this refractory population of patients. They importantly wanted to know when did resistance develop and what clones were the dominant drivers of relapse. And so I like to start uh, in showcasing this data by showing you um, what we call pseudo, pseudo bulk. And this is essentially where we discard the cell identifying barcodes and we use the data uh, as if it was bulk data. And this is uh, shown to be quite concordant with actual bulk sequencing data. Uh, for this particular patient, which is very interesting, they did not have the upfront. So we, we substitute in this, this, uh, this particular data set here. And what you see with typical plots of, of uh, variant to low frequency across a longitudinal set of samples, is um, you know, the, the frequency of each variant at each time point, but to be able to actually conclusively say that any of these particular variants are co-occurring is quite difficult uh, with, with specific accuracy. So there's some inferences you can make. You see a nice response to the FLT3 inhibition where the FLT3 variant is declining over time. Uh, so we have a pretreatment time, two on treatment biopsies, these are bone marrows, uh, and then the relapse time point. And so you see uh, two variants that are directly overlapping each other, IDH2 and SF3B1. So obviously there's a lot of assumptions that these are co-occurring in the same clone. And then you start to see an NRAS variant creep in and expand uh, aggressively at relapse. So they wanted to resolve this architecture and understand what the clonal architecture looked like. And so this is what the single cell data looks like in a bar graph plot showing you the actual clonal frequencies for these, uh, these clones. <clears throat> And so these are the same exact uh, longitudinal time points. So this is your pre-treatment, uh, your two on treatment, and then your relapse time point. Um, and, and so what you see here is that you have a dominant triple mutant clone defined by this blue section. This is the IDH2 SF3B1. And we confirm that this does actually contain the FLT3 variant. So these at this time point are part of the same clone. And you see that start to respond over time as you watch the blue clone collapse uh, in, in, in the subsequent uh, sampling. You start to see um, an expansion of this green clone, which they were not aware of uh, at baseline. And this was actually an IDH2 SF3B1 double mutant clone. Importantly, that is FLT3 negative. Given that this is a monotherapy gilderitinib trial, you know, this is an important insight to understand that, that there's actually a FLT3 negative leukemia clone still present, or actually that was determined to be present at baseline at a 3.8% frequency. And they were not aware of this particular clone in particular because the cutoff for frequency report clinicians was 5% in, in this particular trial. Um, and, and so this was a, um, a really interesting revelation that uh, you know, this was a dominant driver of relapse, as you might expect, given that we now know that it is a FLT3 negative double mutant clone. But what was even more interesting than that is uh, what was presumed to be the uh, mechanism of acquired resistance, or at least uh, or the resistant clone is, of course, whether or not it's acquired or actually present beneath the detectable limit uh, at baseline uh, you know, has not been resolved. But it's, it's certainly possible uh, and, and thought by many to be the case that it, that it did actually pre-exist. Uh, but we detected this clone, which was actually a, a quadruple mutant and presumed to be this triple mutant that acquired this NRAS mutation or a triple mutant that, that had, uh, you know, that was present at baseline and, and, and also had this NRAS mutation. And the co-occurrence of that NRAS mutation together with the FLT3 variant is believed to confer the resistance to the gilderitinib FLT3 inhibitor. And so you start to see an aggressive expansion of this clone. So this was particularly interesting from a single cell perspective because we're able to resolve polyclonal drivers of resistance in this particular patient. 
I'll call out that the dark uh, gray charcoal bars here are actually wild type. So we do have the ability to look at wild type, um, obviously, as we can look at a discrete clonotypes based on the co-occurrence uh, co of genotypes. And in this case, these are the germlines. <clears throat> so with the sensitivity, as, as I showed, and I'll go back to this real quick, just the sensitivity that we show in the, the first on-treatment biopsy, we were able to detect uh, retrospectively, of course, this quadruple mutant at a 0.05% uh, clonal frequency. So as few as three cells out of 7,600 that were profiled in this particular sample. Um, so, so that's quite rare. Um, and now, now that is beneath the 0.1% the that we call as a spec of the system. However, given the fact that we have four different mutations uh, with reads across all of them to, uh, to, to provide you know, confidence, uh, confident genotype and capability here um, across multiple cells, the more genotypes that you have in an individual clone that are being called across multiple cells, the less chance that that is of, of actually being a false positive or an artifact of the data. Whereas if you had a single mutant with a single mutation across only three cells, there's a larger chance that that, that would be a, a potential false positive. Um, so, you know, with when you know what you're looking for, it's a little easier to pull this needle out of the haystack, but certainly on the second on treatment biopsy or 1.2% clonal frequency, we're easily able to detect and call that uh, without prior knowledge of this particular clone. So with the sensitivity capabilities that we saw in that, of course, there's a very specific interest in measuring uh, residual disease in AML patients, and there's a number of different time points in which you could do that with, that could potentially be interested. And we're working with a number of partner institutions in deploying this in a research mode to understand how single cell sequencing may actually advance the capabilities in MRD monitoring of patients. And this is basically the idea that uh, when a patient achieves uh, a remission, we can measure the depth of that remission by understanding uh, whether or not there are persistent clones, disease-specific clones that, that are still there uh, and there have been cutoffs and understandings of you know, prognostic, um, prognostic information that can be uh, gained by understanding the, the depth of remission uh, in terms of the risk of a patient developing uh, relapse or refractory disease. And so uh, we partnered with Stanford uh, to, to deploy single cell sequencing. This is um, Dr. Ravi Majetti's group. And we looked at three different time points, or rather their group looked at three different time points to, to understand how this technology uh, could fit into the MRD space. So again, this is an AML and as background, most frontline patients uh, do achieve complete remission following induction chemotherapy. Unfortunately, the majority of them do relapse, but can, complete remission in this case is defined by morphology at less than 5% uh, blast in the bone marrow. And that's currently typically measured by flow cytometry, uh, you know, immunophenotypically or, or by PCR, qPCR, uh, by genotype, for example, NPM1 PCR. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's been reported that MRD uh, greater than a 0.1% frequency is associated with the worst uh, relapse-free survival and overall survival. So we wanted to stack this up and, and see how, how tapestry performs. And of course, with the capability of looking at multimodal, um, capability of the platform, you actually merge the, the ability of, of two different assays into look at the, the clonal architecture and, and how the genotypes are arranging into clones, uh, along with the actual immunophenotypes uh, down to that 0.1% clonal frequency and potentially beneath. So 14 patients uh, across with three different time points, so the diagnosis uh, and the remission relapse time points uh, for a total of 42 patients were analyzed in this particular study. Um, they were 10 relapse patients and then four non-relapse control patients that were run with the key question basically being, can patterns of MRD and clonal evolution be detected with single cell phenotyping? Uh, this was actually recently published and, and for the sake of time in this particular seminar, I'll share a handful of, of examples here. Um, but snippets of the data, and these are fish plots showing the, the three different time points, diagnosis, remission, and re um, this was sort of a, a you know classic single clone driven relapse where you see uh, a quadruple mutant clone that's MPM1, PTPN11, IDH1, and DNMT3A um, present at diagnosis. And then we detect six cells out of a little less than 5,000 total cells in the remission time point. And then that cell, that population comes roaring back at relapse. And then you, you, we see another interesting case here where you see a background of many different clones. Um, again, this is a, a DNMT3A, IDH1, MPM1, and NRAS quadruple mutant clone here that was the dominant clone at, at diagnosis and also the, di the dominant clone at relapse. And then you see what is thought to be largely chip uh, in the background with this blue color being wild type. Um, and, and so this is potentially an older patient or a patient that 
um, you know, ha has had many uh, prior rounds of therapy, uh, but, but these other clones are thought to be actually CHIP and non-AML specific disease, but perhaps precursors. So this is a higher risk patient. And then as a third example, this was quite interesting because the clone that you see that was dominant at, at baseline was a, a double mutant MPM1 PTP and 11 clone. Um, they achieve a remission. And then we actually see a clonal switching here where an MPM1 uh, Wilms tumor one uh, clone actually grows out from that remission time point to drive relapse. So this was a, you know, a different presentation of relapse in this particular patient, uh, but, but quite interesting. And, and so this is a figure taken directly from that publication, which I've cited here at the bottom, uh, where they call out potential translational applications of single cell DNA sequencing um, assays, specifically in MRD for AML uh, to, to look at you know, and they identify three particular use cases. So one where you identify CHIP, as I showed in one of the examples there, that is other or otherwise MRD negative. So you can move that patient to consolidation. Or you see that a patient is still MRD positive. Uh, so in that case, you may escalate therapy. Um, and then, you know, if you have MRD positivity, but you actually see that there's an actionable genotype in there, that may aid in, in therapeutic selection as well. And so the, they they uh, put these these specific opportunities forward as, as where single cell may play an important role in the future of, of patient care management in the, the setting of acute myeloid leukemia. Um, I'll pivot quickly from to solid tumor and talk a little bit about our, the, the platform's capability in, in um, renal cell carcinoma. And I mentioned that we also have the ability to do CNVs and a lot of what I've talked to to this point has largely been SNV focused. The way that we do CNV in a targeted approach is we can actually uh, place amplicons in an area of interest or a gene of interest or across a chromosome. We look for at least a minimum of three amplicons, ideally five or more, and we would normalize the signal uh, of those amplicons across uh, the, the, the loci of interest for, for which you want to calculate CNV. And we would compare that the, the numbers of reads across the normalized uh, setting of those amplicons and, and, and compare that to the wild type population, which we can isolate in the same, in the same sample. Uh, bioinformatically. And so with those two populations, we can actually calculate integer level CNV. And this is a brief example of that. Uh, these are RCC patient, uh, patient samples um, that, that uh, Dr. Charlie Swanton from the Francis Crick Institute in London had run. And, and so in this heat map here, um, based on the amp numbers of amplicons in the panel, these are the amplicons corresponding to chromosome 3, 9, and 14. You see that there's actually a, a loss of heterozygosity. So the numbers of of copies are represented by color here in this heat map. And then we can actually uh, collapse that data from all of the cells and in individual samples to these specific uh, regions of interest. And you start to see that uh, from what was deployed here, you see that there's a loss of heterozygosity where only one copy is detected of these particular regions of chromosome three um, and, and so on. So um, this is a, a newer application that we launched in September. And this is actually actively being integrated into our Tapestry Insight software. We actually have an R script available now that enables this uh, for both some of our catalog panels that were designed with sufficient amplicon coverage in, in particular loci of interest, and certainly we can build this into custom panel strategies as well. Uh, Dr. Swanton also ran some samples looking at metastatic melanoma, and if you're familiar with the Tracer X uh, protocol that, that they've developed, you know, the, there's the ability to get access to many different metastatic sites as part of a rapid autopsy protocol. And so some of these samples were run um, in this particular setting on, on the tapestry platform, and this used our universal nuclear isolation protocol. Uh, so this was primary melanoma that metastasized to various locations in this particular patient. This just gives you a, a quick uh, photograph uh, of, of how we actually process those tissues or how the, the protocol uh, recommends processing tissues from 30 to 50 milligrams of, uh, of frozen tissue that does not need to be viable, but you know, can be cryopreserved or frozen. And we can isolate million, uh, millions of nuclei from uh, this particular sample. <clears throat> And so once these were sequenced with the, the tumor hotspot panel, uh, we were actually able to map the clonal evolution. And, and I'll show you some interesting data here. But um, we have wild tape measured uh, for these particular variants of interest. We have an inferred founder for the, the melanoma itself, uh, essentially as being the, the most simplistic um, clone present in the architecture of, of the, all the different clones that were measured. They were two different heterozygous positions, one in KDR and one in BRAF, the, the V600K mutation. Um, that went on to become clone one, as we're calling it, which acquired uh, a heterozygous NRAS position. Clone two, uh, the other allele, got a hit as well and became homozygous position. Clone three, we have an additional heterozygous hit to mTOR. Now, on a separate branch, we also then, from the original and founder, uh, founder clone, or inferred founder clone, rather, 
Um, there's an acquisition of a homozygous mutation in NRAS, the G13R, and then we have uh, in clone 5, heterozygous BRAF, G593D uh, mutation acquired. And so we can actually map the, the phylogeny here and see two different branches of evolution where um, you know, you've got this blue branch that leads to that mTOR clone, and then we have uh, this red branch leading to the burgundy clone with the BRAF uh, mutation as well. And what's interesting is when you overlay this into the, the particular uh, sources of each sample, um, you can start to see which clones colonized which organs in the body. Uh, and, and so interestingly, for example, um, over here on the right, the diameter of these uh, circles represent essentially the, the clonal frequency in this particular sample. So in the lung metastatic site, we see a dominant clone 5, this burgundy clone, which has that BRAF uh, G593D mutation. We also see uh, a lesser frequent 14.1% clone 4. In the chest wall soft tissue met, uh, similarly with the chest wall, uh, the other chest wall met, we see a dominant uh, uh, clone two, this NRAS uh, mutation, as well as very minor uh, frequency of the clone one, the 3.3% there and 9.5% in there. One of the chest wall mets importantly has uh, also a minor frequency uh, present of clone three, this NTOR. A uh, non-coding SNV variant as well. On the right, you see the wild type from each sample as well, showing that we can discreetly identify wild type cells in the same sample. And then we ran uh, liver met, um, showing essentially the same uh, path of, of evolution here, uh, or, or metastasis as the chest walls with, with clones one and two. And then normal liver is a control, which is essentially all wild type, although I think there were actually one or two malignant cells that were picked up there as well. Um, so to close out on, on the data section, I wanted to briefly share with you some of the um, multimodal capabilities or multi-omic single cell capabilities on the platform. And the value here, I think, is pretty nicely illustrated by um, these TISNI separations, where we ran four different cell lines, Raji, K562, TOM1, and KG1 cell lines. And, and we uh, separated them based on um, you know, SNVs, CNVs, and protein alone. And as you can see, each has uh, limitations. There, there are known to be four uh, clones mixed in here with SNVs alone. There's actually two that are very, very similar. Um, and, and so we only see three nice clusters here. By CNV, again, there's, there's two very similar clones clustering together in the middle. So we see three groups again. By protein, immunophenotypically, it's not as great of a separation. But when you start merging all, all of these together in, in pairs or all three together, with CNV and protein, we're starting to see better separation uh, by discrete uh, you know, clones that, that have distinct patterns when you're merging these data sets together. But it's when you add uh, single nucleotide variants, copy number variants, and the immunophenotype capability, now we see nice separation of all four clones as, as expected and as known to be present in the cell line study. And so we, we announced this uh, late last year, a partnership with BioLegend, and they're uh, working on, on scaling up and, and getting ready to launch um, some of the first antibody oligo conjugates uh, <clears throat> that are compatible with the Mission Bio platform. And they'll be our primary uh, provider. In the meantime, we are offering uh, a service, a conjugation service, where we can actually manufacture uh, some. And we have a menu of, of antibodies available uh, currently, largely focused on heme markers. Um, th th that are available today for use in the workflow, but BioLegend will be coming on online very soon uh, in supporting the, the broader uh, menu of, of antibodies and, and providing uh, you know, custom panels and that sort of thing. But I wanted to jump into uh, one quick data set, and this is my final set of data before I close the, the, this particular um, presentation. And, and we've had a great partnership with Ross Levine's lab, um, in, in particular, Lindy Miles, who's the first author on, on um, a manuscript that's currently up on BioArchive, uh, together with Bobby Bowman and, and Aaron Vinny, they've been a fantastic team to work with, uh, and they've worked very closely with us to, to be the first uh, group really working in large scale to deploy the genotype and phenotype capability. And so to do that, they actually built a custom 109 Amplicon DNA panel. Uh, and then together with that, they deployed the first uh, Mission Bio made antibody oligo conjugate panel uh, to enable this, this study. They actually processed about 146 primary samples from over 123 patients uh, with the main project aim to, to really understand implications of you know, co-occurring mutations, clonal trajectory, you know, and, and really driven by the impact of co-mutations um, you know, and how mutations can cooperate to drive dominance in particular clones uh, or, or, or you know, not select positively for other clones, depending on, on which mutations co-occur. And then how do those co-mutations um, actually impact the immunophenotypic landscape. And so, um, you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these particular results because actually Ross Levine will be talking next week uh, on, in the fifth instance of this seminar series. So I really encourage you to register. He'll be leading uh, a, a nice 
overview of, of this exact data set here. Um, but, but just to summarize, you know, they saw that uh, really interesting data showing that a numbers of mutations and clonal complexity really increase, uh, as one might expect from clonal hematopoiesis through to uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, uh, through to overt AML. So AML will have the most numbers of, of mutations and clonal complexity, whereas uh, you know, clonal hematopoiesis uh, will have less mutations and less clonal complexity. Um, certain mutations and combinations of mutations were seen to drive clonal expansion, uh, and frequently uh, that's seen in the dominant clone in particular. Uh, correlated, they, they correlated significant differences in uh, the surface protein expression across different clonotypes, and this was really interesting data. Um, and and uh, the bioarchive, as I mentioned, is up and available now, and, and um, you will get these slide decks, so you don't need to jot this down, uh, so you'll be able to, to pull that link shortly. But just to give you a quick over, overview of what the data looks like, and this is directly from the bioarchive uh, with the permission to share, um, where they have a UMAP separation here of communities based on, on clonotype. And then you can start to overlay on top of this separation um, the, the protein expression of specific markers. So this is a plot of CD45RA, uh, where the, the darker orangish red color is corresponding with higher protein expression, as you start to see on the left side here of, of these particular communities. And then the blue uh, is corresponding with lower uh, protein expression of, of CD45RA, as you see in, in some of these other populations here. And then similarly with CD11B, um, you, you can see the same overlay and, and start to look at multiple dimensions of data uh, across these individual cells. <clears throat> Importantly, you can also uh, do heat map analysis looking at the co-occurrence of different genotypes uh, in, you know, with, with, through the lens of one specific immunophenotype. So for CD34, for example, you see very high uh, expression in IDH1 um, co-mutations co with DNMT3A or clones that harbor both those mutations have much higher CD34 expression, uh, whereas you see a, a loss of that in CD11B. And so, as I said, I just wanted to showcase some of that data and what that looks like. I'm going to leave the interpretation and, and uh, far better analysis of their data uh, to the best person that can present it, and that's Ross Levine himself next Tuesday. So uh, please do come back and join us for that. And with that, I will go ahead and wrap and thank you all for, for your attention. Um, I want to thank all of the customers that, that have generated this data, um, UCSF, UPenn, uh, Stanford, and Sloan Kettering, all of my colleagues at Mission Bio. And of course, uh, Mission Bio has been the recipient of a number of uh, SBIR grants and other types of grants in the past to get us up and running, and, and we thank them as well. And with that, I will go ahead and wrap, and we'll take any questions. Thank you, Erin. That was really wonderful. Uh, so I encourage all the participants, if you have any questions, to please uh, locate the Q&A chat bot and type them in, and we'll be happy to answer them. So uh, first question is, is this presentation available later offline? And I can answer that one. It will be. We will email all of the registrants and uh, participants this slide deck. So question for you, Erin, a technical question. What is the recovery rate? What is the percent of input cells that are captured on the system? Yeah, great question. So um, given that we have a unique two-step droplet uh, cartridge, there are two different uh, time points where we're carefully controlling for capture to ensure that we have a very low rate of, of doublets or multiplets, which we can actually uh, easily bioinformatically detect as well. So, uh, but, but we do attempt to reduce that number as much as possible. The, the specifications for the platform has a minimum input of 100,000 cells from which we expect to uh, sequence and report out data on upwards of 10,000 cells. It really depends on uh, the quality of the sample uh, and, and how well the suspension is prepared uh, that, you know, that, that can certainly impact uh, the, the numbers skewing either way. We have you know, samples that run up into the teens, the, the you know, 14, 15,000 cells of throughput captured from 100 to 150,000 cells of input. Uh, and then you know, with, with lower quality samples, uh, maybe where there's a lot of degradation uh, or, or, or cell death, um, you know, you'll see a loss in that number where it may come down to somewhere in the five to 7,000 range. So effectively, you know, if I had to average that out and answer the question directly, I'd say about 10%. Great. Uh, so along those lines, can you use FFPE samples? Great question. Um, we, we certainly have an interest and appreciation for how important FFPE samples are um, to the space and, and to researchers. It's not something currently uh, possible, but, but 
I would say that there are a number of customers very interested in, in working on that problem. And I think there are a number of ongoing uh, works to, to get that running. Uh, and, and you know, certainly there's interest internally. And I'd say it's on our roadmap, but not currently available. All right, uh, next question. A number of the slides show alterations to DNMT3A. Are you able to detect changes to DNA methylation as well? Great question. Yeah, so there's been a lot of interest in, in that uh, in, this, in the single cell spaces. Ataxic and other approaches have, have really uh, come into the prime. Uh, we are not currently supporting that, but certainly, again, that's, that's, that's of interest and I'd say is on our roadmap, but that's not currently available. We're, we're largely focused on genotyping of SNVs, CNVs, and now the, the immunophenotypic analysis as well. Right, so similar question, can the system detect indels like the FLT3 internal tandem duplica uh, duplications? Yes, absolutely. Um, we, have, we have detected um, ITDs, I believe upwards of 90 to 100 base pairs in length. Um, you know, the, the size of our amplicons is anywhere from 180 to 280 base pairs uh, in length. So we're using a two by 150 Illumina sequencing uh, chemistry. And, and so, you know, there's going to be some size limitations in terms of what we can detect uh, dependent on where that amplicon is positioned, where the ITD falls in respect to that amplicon position. Uh, but, but we have successfully called ITDs uh, and that's been reported out in the literature. Excellent. Uh, would this... Uh, would this system work for a PDX mouse model? Yes, absolutely. And we have a number of customers that are, are doing that now with custom panels. Great. Uh, this is fantastic. We're getting excellent questions coming through the, the Q&A. Um, so for CMV detection, how many amplicons are needed for a region? Um, so a minimum of three, ideally five or more. Um, I would say you know, most panels where we're looking at CNV, we're, we're probably looking in the five to seven amplicon range in, in a given loci of interest. Uh, that could be across a chromosome and that could be within a specific gene. Yeah. And I'll add to, just to give context, our catalog panels are between 100 to 300 amplicons. Um, so again, for CNV, you need three to five per target. So you can cover quite a bit of range on a pretty standard size panel. And again, we can go up to a thousand amplicons if you need larger areas of chromosomes for CMV analysis. Okay, uh, and then a question about the protein application. Is it possible to detect intracellular nuclear protein targets? Great question, a lot of interest there. Um, not currently something that we support, but um, I, I, you know, it, it, right now it's not possible, but, but certainly um, I, I would say that that's you know, additionally on our roadmap of interest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I think we have one final question. Um, can you talk about some of the other applications um, that the platform can be used for besides HEME? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I showed, um, we've done a number of, of studies and supported customers in the solid tumor space, um, looking at, you know, the, the prognostic implications of, of clonal heterogeneity at baseline, correlating with outcomes. Um, you know, looking at acquired resistance uh, in, in you know, tumor, solid tumor models as well. Um, you know, there's, there's interesting applications in gene editing as well, and that's another key area I didn't have time to talk about today. Uh, but where there's really interesting data coming out, looking at, you know, quality control capability of intended edits in, in um, you know, in CRISPR models or other, other zinc finger type models um, to, to look at, you know, edit efficiencies where you want edits to occur, but also being able to look in areas of homology for um, off-target edits and, and be able to resolve that into the clonal heterogeneity that, that often results. And so similarly, as you would see, you know, variant to low frequency um, in bulk for the, the examples that I gave in these, these specific translational applications uh, with primary samples, if you take a, a CRISPR edited cell line, you would get variant to low frequencies of the intended edits and confirm that they were successful by seeing an increase or a you know, massive jump in, in the uh, little frequency in that sample. Um, we can actually then resolve that and show that you know, varying zygosity states of those edits occur uh, or don't occur. Um, and and you know, in, in many, many cases, we see literally every possible edit combination of, of different zygosities or failed edits uh, in the scheme of you know, multiple edits intended in a single cell line. So that's another you know, really interesting area uh, of use for, for single cell applications like this. Uh, 
And then we'll sneak in one final question. Is the assay RUO research use only? Yes, it is. Uh, and that's an important clarification. Yes, this is currently a research use only application. All right, with that, I just want to thank everyone for joining our webinar series. And thank you so much, Erin, for explaining what the Tapestry platform is all about. Very good. Thank you so much, everybody.